Welcome to All Gas, All Georgia Sports. I'm glad you guys are here. Got a lot to cover for you today on this Thursday, September 1st. It's September 1st. Oh my God. It's here, you guys. We made it. August is done. August is stupid. It's over. It's in the rearview mirror. Have another year until we have to experience that horribleness again, and I'm so excited. It really is. September, it just feels different. I mean, physically, like, it sounds different. Obviously, it's a different word, but it just, you know, it does something to me just emotionally. I can just, I can already feel that first gust of cool wind coming through in the evenings, you know? The nights are going to be in the 70s. I think I saw, like, lows in the high 60s for the next couple of weeks, so it's here, it's time, we made it, congratulations, give yourself a round of applause everybody, I mean really, it's, um, <sighs> I'm excited about that, so have a lot to cover with enthusiasm as always, we're going to talk about the Atlanta Braves' first two games against the Rockies, we're going to talk about the Atlanta Falcons' roster cuts, and cuts from around the NFL, some of which surprised me, and Tom Brady is back, Calvin Ridley gets robbed, and the lacrosse star turned preseason hero, the Jared Bernhardt story. I'm excited to share that with you. I, uh, I'm fascinated by this guy. I, um... I was surprised at what I found from him, but he's a he, he's a fascinating person. So, yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later. But as always, we're going to start off the show with a trivia question for you. And this trivia question today is courtesy of the table toucher himself. You know who you are out there, buddy. I love you. And his question is, what current MLB manager was the manager of the Birmingham Barons when Michael Jordan played baseball in 1994? So when Michael Jordan played baseball, who was his manager? Hint, he is currently a manager in the MLB today. So think about that. See if you know it. I I expect a good bit of you guys to know this, but maybe not. You know, I mean, it's pretty obscure. If you don't know it, what I can say is when you hear it at the end of the episode, there's a good chance you're going to go, oh, man, you know, it's going to be one of those, like, you know, if you don't know this, you'll you'll be excited to hear it. So, anyways, we're gonna circle back around to that at the end of the episode, as always. But we're gonna start off with some Braves recap. So, the Atlanta Braves and the New York Mets are just winning and losing at the exact same time. Uh, it's very frustrating. We're still three games back in the race. You know, we we lose last night, which we shouldn't have, and then. Well, it depends on when you're listening to this. Sometimes I'll forget about that. I record this a lot of times the night before it's released. So we lose Tuesday night, and we win Wednesday night. Anyways, the Mets did the exact same thing. And quite frustrating because, you know, like I've been saying for multiple episodes now, and I'm just going to reiterate this because I believe it, but, you know, on paper this is the best chance that we have to really gain significant ground in a short period of time because the Rockies are so bad and the Dodgers are so good. So yeah, we've, we've kind of blown that chance. I mean, we still, you know, tomorrow there's a good chance that we can gain a game if the Dodgers come out ahead. And if we beat the Rockies, which we should, you know, I mean, really the Mets Dodgers one is more of a coin toss because they're both good teams, but we should be steamrolling the Rockies, you know, and it's weird to say like, We should sweep every series. I mean, you want to win every series. That's the old Bobby Cox mantra. It's like you just want to win the series, win the series, so you don't get too hung up on a loss. You just want to look at the series as a whole. But, man, right now, it's like, God, who else? The Dodgers have the best chance of beating the Mets. You know, and anyways, you know, whatever. It is what it is. It's Major League Baseball. Anything can happen. Crazier things have happened than us, you know, gaining a three-game deficit on the Mets, you know what I mean? So I think we'll be okay, but the game one on Tuesday night, we lose three to two, and we really, the the highlight for me for that game is we just couldn't close. I mean, we went two for 13 with runners in scoring position, so we had 13 opportunities, one, and we got two hits in those opportunities, so really blew it. I mean, it felt like every single inning, 
I mean, it, it, that might have been the case, actually. We may have left someone on every single inning, like on second base or further. I mean, it was consistent where we just could not capitalize. And it just sucked the life out of the stadium. It was a boring game to watch because of that. Well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Like, you would get excited, you know, when we got someone in scoring position, but then when it was like strike out, ground out, pop up, you're like, God. And it was like, you know, it's like one of those things where when you have one out, and there's a runner on second. You get excited. And then the next guy comes up, swings at the first pitch, and it's a quick ground out, and the runner doesn't advance. And you go, well, shit, okay. Well, now there's two outs. And the next guy pops up on the second pitch. So it's like there were these quick kind of momentum-killing moments. And, you know, it made it for – it made it, it – it ended up being kind of a snooze because of it. And, and there wasn't much energy in the stadium either, which is a rare thing for Truist Park. I mean, we – uh I've got a lot of pride in, in Braves country and being a part of it because we throw it down at Truist Park. We really do. And um, that was not really the case on Tuesday. So anyways, uh, Freed was good. He pitched. I mean, he I think he was credited with the loss, cause he, he, but he only gave up two earned runs, which is enough to work with. You know, you know our offense is good enough to, to be – if we give up two runs every night, that should be far and away a winning record for us. Easy. Um, fun fact about this though, is that Max Fried made his first error on Tuesday night since September 12th of 2021. And he's only had seven errors total in his entire MLB career. I guess that's why he's a two time gold glove winner, two time consecutive gold glove winner, 2020 and 21. And yeah, I didn't know that he only had seven his entire career. And it's the first one he's made in essentially a year. So he's fantastic defensively. So it's a rare thing that happens there, but it did, you know, but Hey, whatever. We came back in Game 2 on Wednesday night to win 3-2, and we got off to a hot start. You know, Riley hit a uh, two-run home run, I think, in the first. And then Acuna, he goes yard. He hadn't done that in a while. At least it's felt like a long time since Ronald Acuna's hit a home run. He hit, uh, it's his first one, actually, since August 13th, and it was a 444-foot bomb to dead center. That dude, when he gets a hold of one, it's different, man. He, um... It sounds different. It really does. It looks different. It sounds different. It travels different. That ball went so far. It was an immediate. As soon as he hit it, it was right away. Austin Riley's kind of, you didn't really know. I didn't expect it to go out because it just barely cleared the, uh, cleared the wall in right center. But Acuna came up and just ripped one. And it was good to see because we haven't seen much of that this year. It was his first one since August 13th. And I don't know what his... Um, last one was before that, you know, but they felt very spaced out because he's either hurt or he's off or he's kind of coming back. You know how it is. I've talked about that enough, but yeah, good to see Ronald do that. Kyle Wright looked great. He goes seven innings, gives up zero earned runs. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the the home plate umpire uh, on Wednesday night was incredibly inconsistent. In the very first sequence from Kyle Wright, he missed a call where it was like this slider that came in and dropped in on the, you know, bottom half of the zone. And it wasn't even borderline, and he called it a ball. I mean, it was like, you know, there was a gap between the little, like, ball circle on the, you know, um, strike zone chart on screen. There was a gap between the ball circle and, like, the bottom line. Like, it wasn't even, like, one of those who was on the line. It could go either way. No, it was all the way in the strike zone. Called it a ball, and it was frustrating, but he did that a couple of times, and then it kind of just progressed throughout the entire game, and it made me think of, um, man, this was one of our earlier episodes, but I, I was talking about the implement, Im, implementation of robot umpires and how they're looking to do that. I think in 2024 is when we're going to start seeing that, but they still don't really know how that's going to manifest. So basically, there's multiple ways they've discussed it, one of which is just straight up a automated system that calls balls and strikes based on that chart that I just mentioned, and it just kind of sends a message to the home plate umpire who then calls it. So it says ball, strike, he calls it, he's got an earpiece, and that's going to be the most automatic, efficient way to do it. It's kind of a bummer because at that point, you know, the home plate umpire, I guess he's there to call plays at the plate, call foul balls, but you know, I mean, he's kind of there for show at that point. And, and the other thing too, is like my thing there, and maybe I'm old school. I like umpires. I almost, 
like having something to bitch about when it comes to um, missed calls. It just adds a human element to the game that's kind of exciting. One of my favorite things, like before they showed the strike zone on TV, I, I sort of still hate that because just I loved watching pitchers when you couldn't see what the strike zone was and seeing a pitcher with really good location and command throughout a game almost create his own strike zone. So they talk about this on broadcast all the time, but when a pitcher is really painting corners all game and, you know, he's hitting the same spot, same spot, same spot, he can almost start to cheat a little bit because it starts to mess with your eyes where if he's hitting this corner and then he goes to the other side of the plate, he can just, you know, a good pitcher can make pitches look good that aren't. And I kind of like seeing that, but, you know, a friend of mine corrected me. He's like, no, that's a terrible take because... If you actually truly want a perfectly fair playing field for both sides, you need everything to be 100% automated all the time, and it's just never inaccurate. I was like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess for the game, that's true, but, you know, call me a purist. I don't know. I just, I kind of like the human element to it, but it was pretty bad tonight. Point being is, um, yeah, there was just a lot of, a lot of missed, missed strikes, and, you know, even missed balls. And so maybe it evens out at the end of the day. I'd be curious to see some of the spreads on that because I know that that's a thing where if an umpire knows that he made some mistakes, because they know, they go back and they they get like a report after the game that shows them what they missed, where they missed, how many they missed. And, you know, the coaches, like, I think they can see it in the dugout. <laughs> like they get replays, they have film where they can be like, no, yeah, that was a ball for sure. But what was I about to say there? Um, I totally lost it. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 here it is. Is I'd be curious to see how things balance out at the end of a game. So if an umpire is missing some, I know that they'll kind of correct them a little bit. You know, you hear, you'll hear you hear people say like, oh, he's making up for a missed one last inning or he gave one to the other team, so now he's going to give one to this team. So um, I wonder how much that truly does balance out at the end of the day for most games. But, you know, regardless, it's just something I noticed from Wednesday night's game. Is it, was, it was a little, well, it was noticeable. Um, Kenley Jansen came in to save. We were up 3-0, actually, in the bottom of the ninth. And he gave up a two-run home run in the ninth inning to a rookie who got his first hit earlier in the game. So good for the rookie. Bummer for Kenley Jansen. He blew that save in St. Louis. Bad, bad, bad blown save in St. Louis. And after he gave up that that two-run home run, there was two outs in the bottom of the ninth. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. So, you know, he, he did become um, the ninth all-time saves leader on Wednesday night. So congratulations to Kenley Jansen for that because he did obviously come away with the save at the end of the day. But after that two-run home run, I was like, man... We do not need him getting cold. You know, we already gave up Will Smith, not Kenley Jansen. He's going to be okay. He's a vet. He's, uh, you know, going to be a Hall of Famer. He's legit. He's awesome. But after St. Louis and then seeing him give up that, I got a little nervous for a second. But we come out, we come away with the win, 3-2, to two, and the Mets win as well. They beat the Dodgers. I think it was 2-1 in New York tonight. And so, yeah, the, the race stays the same. So the last... Uh, I don't know how many games this goes back, actually. It might be the last, um, it feels like 10 games or so, where when we've won, the Mets have won. When we've lost, the Mets have lost, and we've just stayed. No, that's not true, because there was a shift when we were in St. Louis where we lost one, and they won one. So, yeah, plenty of time, and we're well in the lead for the wild card standing, but still another month and a week left in the season. And we see the Mets at the end of this month. I can say that now officially. And we'll see what happens when that comes around. The last bit of Braves news that I have for you is Jesse Chavez is back, baby. The Braves claim him off the waivers just four weeks after trading him to the Angels for Raziel Iglesias. And, you know, Alex Anthopoulos, you know, you dog, you. Well done. (laughs) We gave up, I guess it was just Tucker Davidson is all we gave up, ultimately, for 
Raziel Iglesias. So not sure what happened to Jesse Chavez in Los Angeles. Um, but I, I've liked him. I was actually pretty bummed when we gave him up because at that point in time, like leading up to the All-Star break, Jesse Chavez was legit. He had a few outings in a row where he just looked awesome. His command was on point. His pitches were moving around like crazy. So I was pretty sad when we gave him up, to tell you the truth. So now that he's back, I'm thrilled. I think I, I love seeing him in a Braves uniform. I think I thought he was doing a great job. And so just how you know funny is that, seeing that come back around full circle where we give him up and get him back just a month later. So yeah, well done, Braves. Well done, Alex Anthopoulos. Welcome back, Jesse Chavez. Good to have you back, buddy. Maybe it was a part of the plan the whole time. Who knows? So moving on to the Falcons, we have got the Falcons roster cuts. They are in. And, man, what a hellish thing to have to do. I mean, you know, it's a business. I get it. You got to do what you got to do. It's just, a, I mean, everybody knows it's just a part of being in the league. People move around a lot. But you have to go pretty much in a day from, like, 80 to 53 on your roster. That's a lot of tough conversations to have in a short period of time. I'm sure that weighs on you just as a coach, as a human being. But that's why they get paid the big bucks, as they say. So, you know, I'm not going to go through every single cut that we had, but I'm just going to list you uh, three noticeable or notable cuts from the Falcons roster. So the first one for me was Frank Darby. Then there was Quadri Allison and Justin Schaefer. Justin Schaefer was the sixth-round pick this year out of Georgia. And Frank Darby... You know, I mean, he seemed like he was a little much. I mean, he didn't, his performance, I don't know about his performance. I think he was going into only his second year. I don't think he did that great last year. He did make a great catch in the last preseason game. It was just beautiful over the throat, shoulder throw by Desmond Ritter. Good God, it was so good. But he, you know, it was a great route and catch by Frank Darby. So I was kind of thinking, okay, second year, he might be coming into his own. But what, what was always noticeable to me and why I say he was a bit much was because every time you see him on camera, the dude is just, I mean, over the top. He's almost like a little, like if Guillermo Heredia was turned up one more notch, that would be Frank Darby. And you almost wonder, like, would that be too much? And I kind of think it was. I mean, I don't know the guy personally. I wasn't around. I mean, everyone said he was really funny. I know that, you know, it's, he, he seemed in really good spirits all the time, and all the guys seemed to uh, react well to him. But I was surprised when they cut him because, you know, we don't have too many people coming back in the receiver room. And I thought he was looking pretty good in the preseason, but, you know, what do I know? And the next one that surprised me was Quadri Allison, especially because he was getting a lot of reps in the preseason. He looked pretty good. Um, and I didn't realize this, but when he was a rookie, he actually led the Falcons in touchdowns, and rushing touchdowns. And, you know, but he's just never really become that guy. I mean, I don't know. How, how long do you keep, like... What do they say? Good is the enemy of great. You know, I mean, he seemed good, but uh, I guess, you know, they just wasn't good enough. So I, I was just surprised to see that because he's been on the team now for a few years, I think. I don't know if he's going into a second or third or maybe more, but, you know, I I, I was I kind of thought that he was going to be one of the dudes this year, but I think they're fully expecting. I mean, you got Cordero Patterson, but the dude's getting older. I don't think they're going to have him as a, this bell cow running back at this point, especially considering, you know, that Patterson can play all over the place. Um, they got Tyler Algier. I think they're expecting big things out of him. Caleb Huntley was really impressive to me in the preseason. I saw him make a few just really explosive runs. He had like 19 carry. Caleb Caleb uh, Huntley had like 19 carries in the final preseason game. And tore it up, I mean, but just looked explosive. So, you know, I guess they have enough depth, and uh, Quadri Allison was not a part of that. So always interesting, too, to see what happens to these guys because, you know, sometimes teams will cut players, and it's not even necessarily because they're bad. It's just when you have to get to a 53-man roster, and let's say, you know, you're you're thin at one position and you're really stacked at another, and in order to either make room or to keep the depth that you have you know, let's say on the D line, but you have 10 receivers and you have your main starters and you have guys that could play, but it's like, crap, you know, you just got, you have to make that decision. So always interesting to me to see where players go, uh, after being cut. And because some of them get re-signed to the practice squad, 
I think if they clear waivers, meaning no one else picks them up or gives them a shot, he's actually a friend of the family, played for the Falcons for a long time, and he was, this is back in the 90s, and he got cut, and then he was uh, driving back home to Arizona, and when he was on his way back, he got a call saying, hey, never mind, come back, we we might have a spot for you, and he ended up playing for them for like, uh, maybe like eight seasons or something, had a great career, and so you, you just, you never know what's going to happen, so yeah, we'll see what happens with those guys. Maybe they come back for the practice squad or someone else picks them up and, you know, they become amazing. <laughs> that would suck. I mean, not for them, but you know what I mean? So, and yeah, Justin Schaefer didn't make it. He was an offensive lineman, six-round pick out of Georgia. I kind of thought that anybody coming out of Georgia was just going to crush it, but, you know, it's funny, man. You see, um, you know, they just won the national championship. Their team was so stacked, but NFL is a different beast it's a different level so yeah played on a national championship team but couldn't cut it in the NFL and then you know you never know who will cut it uh which leads me to my next topic which is Jared Bernhardt so you got a guy who got cut who was a national champion and you have a guy who made the team who played at like a D2 school and was a lacrosse star so get this, Jared Bernhardt, and if you don't know who that is, he was the guy that caught the late game winner in game one of the preseason uh, in Detroit, and he has made the team as a receiver. So I was looking at an article from ESPN written by Michael Rothstein because I was kind of asking myself, like, how good of a lacrosse player was he? Because I just keep hearing Jared Bernhardt, Jared Bernhardt, Jared Bernhardt, say that three times fast. I keep hearing his name and people go, the former lacrosse star, the lacrosse star out of Maryland. And it's like Chris Hogan, Chris Hogan with the Patriots. He was like that. And, uh, so yeah, I was like, okay, how good of a, of a lacrosse player was he really? Is it just kind of a cute, fun thing to say because it's an interesting story or was he actually a good lacrosse player? Well, in his last season at Maryland, He completed the best offensive season in Maryland history and set school career records for points and goals. Points 290, goals 202. He led the Terrapins to the national championship game last year where they lost to Virginia, but he uh, also won the, see if I pronounce this right, the Tiwaraton Award as the best player in college lacrosse. So I'm assuming that's sort of the Heisman for lacrosse players. And he got it. So yeah, was he good at lacrosse? Um, Yeah, he really was. He was the best player in lacrosse, in lacrosse, apparently. So that's pretty cool. I had no idea that he was that good. But what's even more interesting to me is that initially, before he went and played lacrosse at Maryland, he was recruited by Navy as a dual-threat quarterback out of high school, but he elected to play lacrosse instead. His family was a big lacrosse family. And after his last season playing at Maryland, when they went to the national championship, he then went on to play quarterback at Ferris State in Michigan, where uh, they went undefeated and won the Division II National Championship as a dual-threat quarterback. Uh, he Now, injuries limited to only limited him to only 10 games in that season, but he completed 70% of his passes for 1,300 yards, 11 touchdowns, 5 picks. He also ran 159 times for 1,421 yards and 26 touchdowns. Um, he also had one reception for 33 yards. So funny enough that after hearing those stats, he ends up making the Falcons roster as a receiver. So basically when he was playing lacrosse at man, and there's a lot more depth to this story and it's actually, um, you know, it's, it's really just inspiring and interesting to hear. So basically his family's a big lacrosse family, but he loved playing football in high school too. And his father actually passed away in 2019 from leukemia. And before that happened, apparently they discussed him pursuing football. And because they discussed that right before his passing, that's said to have given him a little extra motivation. I'm sure it did. And so we always kind of had this thought where he wanted to go play football. And he and he went to go try and play at Ferris State, small school. Um, weird, though, that he didn't go play at Navy because that would have been, you know, a uh, I think bigger deal than Ferris State, but who knows? He uh, he initially went to go play, but then COVID shortened some seasons. It kind of made things a little more complicated. He ended up going back home to Florida, and he didn't know if he was going to play lacrosse anymore. He had already played a couple of seasons at Maryland, and then you know I think once COVID kind of eased up a bit, he went and played that last season at Maryland where he tore it up and won the national championship, got that award for the best player. 
And then he was studying film like throughout the entire lacrosse season. He was studying football film from Ferris State, this college up in Michigan. And so once he was done playing lacrosse, he calls the coach at Ferris State and he says, hey, I'm ready to play immediately. I've been studying film this whole time. I'm good to go. And they were like, what? So, you know, he went up there to play and they didn't know who was going to be the starting quarterback. But in the first game, he had like three rushing touchdowns. So he secured the job after the first game. And all he did was just crush it across and watch football film and then went and won a Division II national championship. Now, I don't think he was starting when they won the actual national championship, but he played 10 games and had some crazy stats. I mean, just the fact that he had 26 touchdowns. I don't know if that was total touchdowns or just rushing touchdowns, but either way, if it was total, that means that it was 15 rushing touchdowns in 10 games. So, uh, yeah, it, and it's funny that, like I said, after hearing those stats that he ended up becoming a receiver in the NFL. So he's just one of those types of athletes. Um, these guys are next-level athletic. You know, last episode I talked about Nick Chubb jumping over the moon in just warm-ups for track meets. And there's a picture of that on our uh, TikTok. And that's been a... <clears throat> that video is actually kind of blown up. But... These guys are just next level. There's a story, um, I know some guys out in Colorado, and they played against Christian McCaffrey in high school. And even growing up, like in Little League and stuff, like they, I knew some guys who were just the same age as Christian McCaffrey and lived in a similar area. So they just ran into him a bunch, you know, playing sports growing up. And this one guy was like, yeah, man, when we were in high school, we played his team in soccer, and Christian McCaffrey was on their team, and he scored like 11 goals. <laughs> And he was like, you know, and then we played him in basketball and he just torched everyone. And then in football, obviously, he did the same. So these guys who are playing, you know, professionally, they really are. They're, they're generational type athletes. They're next level. And even though you may not have heard of Jared Bernhardt, unless you're a hardcore college lacrosse fan, then you've probably heard of him. But keep your eye out on him because... uh. I'm excited to see what he does. I mean, just with a story like that and an athlete like that with those kind of accolades and that kind of backstory. And I know that Arthur Smith is a big-time lacrosse fan. He's openly talked about that. He's a big-time lacrosse and basketball fan. And so I guess knowing that about him personally, you know, not surprising that he may have noticed him in college playing lacrosse and then just, I guess, just kept an eye on him. I mean, these it's pretty cool too. Like, you know, you think like, oh, man, like, who we're thinking about when we watch the NFL draft, you know, we see all these SEC guys, we see the stars at Alabama, the stars at Georgia, the stars at, you know, whatever. And so that's who we have in mind when the draft comes up. But these NFL staffs are watching guys for a long time. You know, I mean, they found Troy Anderson out of Montana State, who talk about another freak athlete. He was like the running back of the year, in college, the next year, he was the quarterback of the year at college. This was in, like, the the Sky League or something at Montana State. And then he ended up being the linebacker of the year. I mean, he's just – he does everything. So another guy to keep your eye out on – to keep your eye on – I'm saying that wrong. To keep your eye on is Troy Anderson, another freak athlete rookie. So we've got a couple of guys like that that are just um, – I don't know. what. And I think also when you play those many sports and when you come from a small school – and maybe it's just, um, it has the effect on me that, like, I really want, and I always think that that hole-in-the-wall restaurant is going to be great, going to be the best. And the truth is, um, most of the time, they're not that good. A friend of mine and I were talking about that about a year ago, where we were like, what's this fascination with hole-in-the-wall restaurants, where it's like, oh, that you get the best barbecue in the middle of nowhere, outside of a gas station. Look, I've eaten a lot of barbecue. That's not true. You want to get the best barbecue, go to, like, the city of Atlanta. And there's some really good restaurants where there's just these very well-trained chefs. Now, granted, when you find a hole-in-the-wall in the middle of nowhere that's amazing and that's legitimately really good, it is better. Like, that is really cool, and I love seeing that. But I have almost the same pull to these guys who have these kind of obscure stories coming from really small schools, playing multiple positions, coming, you know, um, dual sport athletes and stuff like that. When you hear about those things, you just want them to succeed that much more because it's just, 
I don't know, as a human being, as a competitor, as someone who loves sports, I just love seeing things like that. So Jared Bernhardt, congratulations for making the team. You caught everyone's attention for that uh, very dramatic first preseason game. I know it's the preseason and all, and I get it, and it doesn't mean anything, yada yada, but that was legit, watching Desmond Ritter drive down the field and make that fourth down throw that was like 30 yards in the end zone. for his, And he's the one that caught it. Jared Bernhardt caught that pass. So um, he beat that guy one-on-one. And uh, so fun stuff there. He made the team. Some other notable cuts from around the NFL. And, you know, this just kind of goes to show, you know, Aaron Rodgers was on the uh, Joe Rogan experience this last week and talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> he talked about all sorts of stuff. But um, one thing that he said that uh, was interesting to me was the average length of stay in the NFL is about three years. And that makes sense. You know, I mean, so many guys, like, even if they were really good one year, you never know if they're going to get cut the very next. So to give you an example, notable cuts from around the league. Sony Michelle got cut. Philip Lindsay got cut. Sonny Michelle got cut from the Dolphins. Philip Lindsay from the Colts. I'm not going to know the teams for the rest of these guys, but I'm going to list off these names. So Sonny Michelle, Philip Lindsay, Willie Sneed, Chris Conley. I just know him because he's a Georgia guy. Marlon Mack, Josh Rosen, Kellen Mond, OJ Howard, Josh Gordon, Laquan Treadwell, and Duke Johnson all got cut this week from their respective teams. And... I'm just surprised to hear some of those names. I mean, it was only like two years ago that I was picking up some of those guys off the waiver wire in my fantasy league, and they crushed it. I mean, you know, the waiver wire is what's going to win you the championship. Let's be real. The draft is important and all, but the real champs are the ones who make moves and free agency and on the waiver wire. And all of those guys were like waiver wire champions not that long ago, so to see that they got cut, you know, it just gives you some perspective, I guess, about what this league is really about. I mean... It's tough, man. How long can you really perform like that physically, you know, and I don't know, like, how dedicated do you have to be to continue to perform at this level after age, like, 26 or 27? You know, I don't know. But yeah, it's, uh, I was surprised to see a lot of those names. Now, just like the others that I mentioned with the Falcons, who knows where they're going to end up. A lot of those names, I'm sure, are going to jump off the board to a lot of other teams around the league who might need some depth at their respective positions. And so you might see those guys, you know, get some opportunities elsewhere. That happens a lot every single year. But, yeah, man, it's, it's what have you done for me lately, you know? So... Wish the best for those guys personally, but man, even Philip Lindsay, I mean, he was a freaking stud not long ago. Sony Michelle won the Super Bowl not long ago. I mean, I guess maybe he's, but he's he came out in the draft the same year that Nick Chubb did. And I think if I'm not mistaken, did he get drafted ahead of Nick Chubb? I think he did. So, um, yeah, trippy. Uh, so those are the NFL notable cuts that I have for you. I think that's all that I have on the NFL. I'm going to actually skip ahead to this story real quick. Tom Brady comes back. Uh, he was out for 11 days for personal reasons. I know a lot of people, I'm sure Buccaneers fans, were getting nervous about that. They go, uh-oh, is he going to retire again? And he came back in a press conference after his preseason game um, that he came back for. He was like, you know what, look, I'm 45 years old, and I got a lot of shit going on. It was personal reasons. But he said everything's okay, everything's fine. Um, and you know, I'm kind of with, I think the collective reaction to this, which is, it is nice to remember that these people are human. And so, you know, good for him for taking care of whatever he needed to. Um, you know, like it's interesting. I, um, I try on this podcast to be as positive as I can, although I will kind of randomly have rants about teams that I don't like, or fan bases that I don't like, or maybe I'll get, animated about certain things and you know I consider most of the time that to be just sort of just me being an emotional ridiculous stupid fan and but I did I do remember that I had a this was in an earlier episode it was after the home run derby and I was ripping Ronald Acuna I was talking about how you know his attitude there sucked like what's he doing he just kind of after he you know sort of just like 
throws his hands up at the home run derby. He just sits on his phone and is acting like a weirdo. Like I was, I kind of just went in on him pretty hard and it was pretty funny because like when I listened back to the episode, there was a couple of really like, I don't know, just ridiculous sound bites. And some of those are, um, you know, get some of the biggest traction, uh, for us on like YouTube and, and TikTok and stuff. So it's fun to post those, especially things that make me look like an idiot because the comments go crazy. People go, dude, you're, you're nuts. You're stupid. Whatever. The, the, uh, last two episodes ago, I basically went through the Georgia schedule and just said, yeah, we're going to destroy everyone and go undefeated and win the national championship. And so people are giving me a hard time, but I love that kind of stuff. Cause it's like, even if I'm talking trash about like Mets fans and, you know, the Saints or the Florida Gators or whatever, you know, it's cool. It's fans being fans. But like I, it was personal when I was like going after Ronald Acuna and I had posted these clips on TikTok and YouTube and they were blowing up. And this is after I'd only done a few episodes. So it was kind of cool seeing, oh man, I'm getting all these views and all these comments and all these likes. But then I felt dirty about it. I was like, I don't want to be that guy who just like is tearing these people apart. They're human beings. And I remember thinking like, that's a human being. Like, and the episode's still live, so you can go listen to it. It's not, like, that bad or whatever. It was just about a three-minute rant where I was just roasting him pretty hard. Um, but uh, where am I going with this? Yeah, I ended up pulling those videos down because I was like, I don't know. I don't want to get all of this traction based on that. I'd rather it be about something that I that's more fun, you know? I don't know. That's just kind of the theme that I have for this podcast is I want it to be good feelings and fun to listen to and and I'll go off on stuff randomly, but that's the that's what that, that's the vibe I'm, I want to pull people in based on that. So, with that being said, it's this is just another reminder that these are human beings and they have things going on. However, I don't know. I will say this. Speaking of going off on some kind of random, you know, theory here, It was an 11-day absence, and they say that it may have been scheduled ahead of time. So, you know, a pre-planned 11-day trip. Maybe he went out of the country. A lot of talk about ayahuasca lately. I mean, I'm just saying that kind of the timeline checks out. That's about the amount of time that you would need to go to South America, drink a little bit of tea, come back being spiritually enlightened. So, hey, maybe Tom Brady's riding the ayahuasca train. Maybe him and Aaron Rodgers talked and... He's going to come back and win another MVP. Um, I don't know. I'm just kidding. I'm, 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 I'm glad he's well. But I, I literally thought that. As soon as that, I was like, oh, he went and he just like tripped balls for like a week and a half and now he's going to crush it. So um, if that ended up being what he was doing, it would be hilarious. I would kind of love that. But it doesn't sound like it. It sounded like it may have been something a little more personal that he wanted to take care of. And if he did that successfully... Hey, Tom, I'm happy for you. You have broken my heart plenty of times in my life. I actually don't think I have ever in my life rooted for you in a Super Bowl, even when you were like uh, like your first one. I think I remember after you won your first Super Bowl, that story was cool because of just the way that you won it coming in and not knowing who was going to start. You were Drew Bledsoe and you kind of leading them there and then finishing the job. That was cool. But I rooted for you hard against the Panthers, hard against the Eagles. I think because the Eagles beat the Falcons that year in the playoffs, so I wanted them, you know, I wanted to lose to the champs, you know. Rooted for you. uh, No, rooted against you against the Seahawks. The Falcons, obviously, rooted against you there. And and then after that, it's just been I've I've wanted to see you get destroyed. And, And maybe at this point, it's just like, I don't know. It's like if you're just that good and keep winning all the time, then I just, I I don't even like dislike him. I mean, I you know, he's kind of a fascinating person to me at this point, being 45 years old and st- still playing like this. It's unbelievable. So glad he's well, and uh, and he didn't miss a beat. I mean, he looked great in that preseason game, and I just can't believe how much arm strength the guy still has. I mean, remember Peyton Manning's last year at, I don't know, what he was, he was 38, I think, in Peyton Manning's last year when he won the Super Bowl, and it was like his arm strength had noticeably depleted you know, when he got real skinny. I've actually thought that about Matt Ryan, where it's like he just looks really skinny. And who's, you know, you want to know who's not skinny is uh, Marcus Mariota. That dude's jacked. Have you guys seen pictures of Marcus Mariota? I mean, I never really, I guess, paid attention because he was playing with Tennessee and then Oakland. I don't really follow those teams that closely. I I, I know Marcus Mariota fairly well from just being a fan over the years, but um, just of football. But 
uh, I saw a press conference today, and he like he just had his like um, Under Armour like undershirt on or whatever, and the dude looked like a freaking anime drawing. He was like ripped. Um, why am I saying this? Oh yeah, Tom Brady doesn't look like that. He he still looks like he's in shape and. He's throwing the ball really hard, and at 45 years old, he's uh, he's got as much arm strength as I can ever remember seeing him have. I mean, it's unreal. The dude's, he's a freak. He's a freak of nature. Um, so yeah, glad you're well. So speaking of Matt Ryan, actually, shout out to Matt Ryan. I'm going to, uh, uh, well, I'm not wrapping up the show, actually, because I skipped ahead. Okay, yeah, I'll finish this thought. Shout out to Matt Ryan. So check this out. Matt Ryan, um... He was trending on Twitter for a little bit because FanDuel put out this, like, who's better, Matt Ryan or Kirk Cousins? It was pretty unanimous. Everyone in the comments was saying that it was Matt Ryan. But one guy named Matthew Denny, uh, shout out to you, whoever you are, he, in the comments, put up this chart, and it was uh, Matt Ryan's rankings and records. So get this, just for some perspective on how good he is, because I know there's a lot of Matt Ryan haters amongst Falcons Nation, and you got to get some perspective. So get this. In 2016, he had 119.9 passer rating. Number one in NFL history, regular season plus postseason, with a minimum of 500 passing attempts. Best passer rating ever in history that year. He has 401 career touchdowns. Uh, he has 120 wins as a starting quarterback. That's more than Johnny Unitas and Joe Montana. He's His total career touchdowns on the road are 201. Dan Marino also has 201. In his rookie season, he had the third best QBR for a rookie, the the third most game-winning drives as a rookie. Um, There's a number of other stats here that actually I don't understand the acronym. But he has, uh, in 2016, he had the most ever yards per attempt in NFL history. He he has a 100.8 passer rating in the postseason, and... 126.5 126.5 passer rating in NFC Championship games, and in the Super Bowl, his passer rating was 144.1, uh, which is the best passer rating amongst, let's see, 62 Super Bowl starters over the last 31 years. Oh, that makes sense. So over the last 31 years, he has the best passer rating of anyone who started a Super Bowl since 1990. Um, 4,000 total yards 11 times. Every season from 2011 to 2021, he had 4,000 total yards. Um, Highest total QBR than, let's see, higher total QBR than Aaron Rodgers eight times. So, in okay, eight times in 14 seasons, he's had a higher total QBR than Aaron Rodgers. I mean, there's more. I can keep going. I mean, I don't know. He's just um, 33 career fourth quarter comebacks, more than Elway, Montana, and Aaron Rodgers. Seriously? 42 game-winning drives, more than Elway, Montana, and Aaron Rodgers? Since 2012, he's number one in the NFL in pass completions. He's the number one NFL in passing yards since 2012. Um, Through his first 14 seasons, he's number one all-time in passing completions, number one all-time in passing yards through a player's first 14 seasons. I mean, are you kidding me? The dude's, just by that alone, he's a Hall of Famer. So a little bit of love coming Matt Ryan's way, which I like. I'm a big Matt Ryan fan. I get it. I understand why people, um, he's been in this weird position where he's been good enough to be compared to guys like Brady and Rodgers and Breeze. And those statistics, some of those statistics show that he's better in those ways. But I do think that just on the eye test, you can watch him versus those guys. Other than Matt Ryan's kind of like, I don't know, I guess you can call him prime years. We'll we'll see what he's yet to do in Indy, but... um, In his prime years with the Falcons, he certainly looked, I mean, he deserved those comparisons, especially after he was the MVP. Um, So, but I understand because he got into that conversation, but didn't seem to like really establish himself in that conversation, if that makes sense. So I get it, but (laughs) I mean, since he became our quarterback, there's a very short list of people who you could say confidently that you would have rather had. Um, I mean, really. So the dude's legit. Happy that Matt Ryan was getting some love this week on Twitter. So last thing I'm going to say is there's, this was just interesting, a bit of an of Atlanta news generally. 
um, but it did affect a Atlanta Falcon. So an indictment was filed on Monday charging 26 people in relation to home robberies of Atlanta celebrities, including Mariah Carey and Calvin Ridley, targeting people who share their wealth on social media. The district attorney, uh, Fannie Willis, said, I do have a message for the public where it is kind of fun for you to put your things on social media and show off. Unfortunately, these gangs are becoming more savvy, more sophisticated in the way that they target you. Well, I don't even know how savvy or sophisticated you have to be to just look on, you know, Instagram and see somebody posting all of their really expensive shit in their house. (laughs) So, you know, unless you have your home in an LLC, which a lot of these, you know, celebrities hopefully do, you could look up, you know, uh, tax assessment data and pretty much find out where anyone lives. So, uh, you know, a reason why a lot of really well-known people buy their homes in the name of a trust or an entity or an LLC or something like that. It's an extra layer of privacy because, yeah, you know, those things can happen, especially when you're uh, active online and showing the world, um, you know, how much nice stuff that you have. So glad that some charges are filed, at least for that, because they've hit more people than Mariah Carey and Calvin Ridley. Those are just the two notables for me, but there's a number of people who are, you know, have some sort of celebrity status. There was like a 16-year-old, I don't know, social media influencer or star that was involved in a pretty sketchy scenario where I think they were there at home when when they got broken into. So, yeah, glad those guys are getting charged. Uh, They suck. So um, to wrap up the show, we're going to circle back around to our trivia question. And the trivia question was, if you remember, this is courtesy of the table toucher himself. What current MLB manager was the manager of the Birmingham Barons when Michael Jordan played baseball in 1994? And the answer to that question is, Michael Jordan's minor league baseball manager was Terry Francona. Terry Francona. He is uh, currently the manager for the Cleveland Guardians? Yeah, Guardians. I forget they changed their name. Um and I think he was probably the most well-known when he was uh, coaching for the Red Sox. But, yeah, Terry Francona, he was Michael Jordan's minor league manager. He states that if he had three years in the minors, he would have made it to the major leagues. Just based on his work ethic and talent alone, you know, he had gotten to the point where he was becoming pretty good. And if you have seen The Last Dance or if you know anything about Michael Jordan in the 95 lockout year for baseball, um, you know, he probably would have gotten an opportunity to play but he decided that he was not going to, I guess, have a player lockout be his window to the majors. He wanted to get it the right way, but I think at that point he was ready to go play basketball again. Anyways, you know, the stars kind of aligned for him to, of course, come back and get his second three-peat. So funny how the world works. You know, there's the old story. Maybe I'll leave you with this story. Usually I leave you guys with a little go make someone's day, but, you know, this is a bit of perspective. So... Yeah, go make someone's day. Go do some good in the world. But here's a story for you to take with you. Um, It's the uh, farmer and his son. So there's a farmer and his son who have a horse. And the horse escapes from the stable and runs off into the woods. The neighbor comes by and says, oh, I saw that your horse escaped. How unfortunate. And the farmer says, we'll see. Then a day later, the horse comes back and brings with him four other horses which now, you know, in this village makes these people quite wealthy for having five horses in total. So the neighbor comes by and says, oh my God, your horse came back and I see that he brought with him four other horses. How fortunate. And the farmer says, we'll see. So then the next day, his son is trying to break in these horses and one of the horses bucks him off of their back and he falls off and breaks his leg. The neighbor comes by and says, I see that your son broke his leg. How unfortunate. The farmer says, we'll see. The next day, there's a war that breaks out, and the village leaders are coming by, and they're recruiting every able-bodied young man in fighting condition. And they pass on the farmer's son because the son broke his leg. The neighbor comes by the next day and says, I see that your son did not get taken into battle. How fortunate. The neighbor, of course, or the farmer, of course, says, we'll see. So this is an old Chinese proverb, and I think the moral of the story is not to get too high or too low. You never know what's around the corner. You never know what life has in store for you. And, you know, just do the next right thing. So that's what Michael Jordan did, and he ended up winning three more championships. So good for him. So whenever something bad's going on or something good's going on in your life, you know, we'll see. 
try to just stay level-headed, keep doing the next thing right, and you can do that by being of service to your fellow man and woman. So do that today. Go make someone's day. Go be a good person. And thank you, as always, for listening. I will see you guys tomorrow, actually, because I've um, been a little off schedule this week. Usually it's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays that I'm recording. But I got off schedule, so this will be coming out on Thursday. Another episode will come out on Friday. So with that, stay tuned. Thank you for listening. See you soon.